So from those kinds of magical environments, um, an uh, encounter with um, Master Leonard was achieved. And once that connection was built or was achieved, uh, maybe it was a kind of genius Loki at first. Um, once that was achieved, um, a society was basically formed around that um, entity and the pact which was created with that entity um, to uh, basically become a type of um, guide um, to lead initiates into um, a state of consciousness which we call night consciousness. A type of um, world experience um, that allows the individual to reconnect to the cosmos in a very different way than it is possible for the average Westerner. Hello and welcome to the Spirit Box podcast, where we explore folklore, magic, the world of the spirits and everything in between. Today we welcome David Beth on the subject of the black man and night consciousness. This is a riveting conversation and one I got an awful lot from and I, I, one I think you're going to enjoy. David was born in Angola, Africa. He is the co-owner of Theon Publishing and the founder of the Pandemonic Current and Hierophant of its associated initiatic groups. University educated in Germany and the USA, he has received various Western esoteric transmissions and is well known for his past work as the former head of Michael Burlow's Voodoo Gnostic Orders. For the past decade, he has focused most of his attention on advanced work with a small group of dedicated esoteric students. David is also an initiate of Haitian voodoo and an initiate of Afrocentric secret societies. Having lived and travelled all over the world, David now makes his home in the south of Germany. Today, however, David takes us through how the Black Man of the Sabbath leads the initiate into a different type of consciousness with which to engage the world. This type of consciousness is called night consciousness. The path to this type of consciousness can often require one's worldview to be entirely shattered, a difficult and often horrifying experience. This show, I, I think, is and, and how David explains this is really important for those who have been following the, 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 the arc of the Dark Man through this, this show's history, because it really lands what this is all about, where the Dark Man brings us to. It also highlights how our folklore really contains encoded and, and embedded within it a mirror to initiatic experience and, uh, and tradition that we have lost through time. There's a lot here, you know, you're going to need to strap in for this one. Now in the Plus Show, David takes us deeper still into his teaching. We explore the concepts of good and evil. We talk to death. And David outlines why every life is unique and sacred, but probably not in the way that you would expect. And there is, there's some huge concepts we go through here, and, and, and really it's not to be missed. And my thanks again to David for uh, so openly sharing his knowledge on this subject. Um, do check the links below because I think there's some further reading there that will be beneficial. Um, and some links to topics that we go through like Master Leonard and Katabasis. So there's lots of there's lots of deep concepts here, and you know, as I said, I'm very grateful to David for his time and sharing his knowledge with us. Now, if you want to hear the full plus show, then check the link tree links below, and that will take you to the Patreon, uh, where you can subscribe and get not just the full extended version of this show, but the entire back catalogue and numerous numerous bonus shows and contents and discussions. Loads and loads of stuff there. It's about I guess three years worth now. And just before we get into it. Uh, just a reminder that I'm talking at an event called Gin and Tonic on December the 16th and 17th. It's a magical weekend exploring the nature and energy of the gin. I'll be covering the history, the types of magic, the types of manifestations, and, and taking through my own uh, experiences, uh, shooting stories on the gin and how things went a bit sideways. Um, so if you are interested in that, check the link in the show notes and uh, come and join us on the, the 16th, 17th. Okay, let's get on with the show. Okay. 
Well, it is my uh, it's my great pleasure to to welcome uh, David Beth to the Spirit Box. Uh, David, you're most welcome. I'm lovely to have you on the show. Um, particularly after um, we've exchanged emails, I guess over the last um, what close to a year now. Um, so really, really fantastic to have you on the show. Really excited. Uh, I know the audience are really uh, waiting for this. This is going to be our Halloween show. Um, <laughs> so hopefully it's going to be spooky yeah <laughs> <laughs> so you're very welcome to the show and could you introduce yourself and, and tell the people a little bit about yourself well um i guess some uh, some people know me basically i guess uh, mainly from my background with michael bertiu i used to be uh, uh deeply into a system i used to be um the head of michael bertiu's um cluster of of orders um but for a long time now, uh, I have uh, deviated uh, from there. I uh, left that more neoplatonic and um, transcendentalist environment, and uh, I have um, gone more into um, what I would call, you know, my roots, which is basically a more catonic, um, Tellurian kind of um, esotericism, which has always been with me, basically, even in those days when I was operating uh, within uh, Michael Bertiu's system, um, because uh, Afrocentric spirituality has always been very big on my agenda. And um, as uh, some people may know, I'm also a voodoo priest. I've been initiated in Haiti as a, as a Ghana Sogwe, um, and I have some other Afro centric um, initiations and um, you know a host of western uh, initiations as well i'm also a gnostic bishop i have a gnostic church uh, that i run as well so yeah you know um uh, bits and pieces uh, you know um in the last couple of years um, i have been more private in my work um while i guess uh, for a while i was quite visible um nowadays uh, i keep quiet um about my work pretty much and I work with a very focused group of initiates um and colleagues one who's been to your show uh recently um thomas vincente um yeah so this is basically what i do and um i'm uh, pleased to be in your show I'm very happy to uh, you know have a chat today and see where this goes um yeah and uh Great. let's go for it Brilliant. Well, um, yeah, it, it, it was a fantastic chat with with, with Thomas. Um, and you very kindly um help helped us uh make the connection, and um, and we spoke about uh Thomas's work, the the, the faceless god, um, which uh, which was a really fantastic book. Really enjoyed that. Um, and it was um adjacent to to my own work um on, on kind of the and the dark man uh which you've uh, contributed to as well uh, very kindly um on the topic of of master leonard um i, I love we're just i'm just throwing in these massive topics you know as we're, we're sure, go for it love this conversation <laughs> people will love it yeah but um w one of the areas that I, i've been really looking forward to 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 talking to you about and 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 picking your brains on is is your view of all of the, the the sabbatical uh the black man of the of the of the, the sabbath um who i would view as, as as the dark man or it's an adjacent expression of the, of the same current um so i was hoping if we could we could start there sure sure i mean i'm gonna try to kind of like uh I'm going to try to like engage it from an angle so people will actually still be interested <laughs> to reading the piece I have in your book. <laughs> so, you know, you're, we're not taking uh, things away from your work, which is a brilliant uh, book as far as Thank I can uh, judge it. So, you know, it's going to be great. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, do you just want me to throw out? Uh, yeah, let, let's, let's general... go. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Well, the Black Man of the Sabbath for me is one of the central. Um, icons of my own um, work that I do within a, a circle or within a current that could be defined as witchcraft, I guess, to a more traditional witchcraft, but which the people involved do not really define as that. Um, but for outsiders, it may look like a more traditional witchcraft rather than anything else. So um, the people involved calls, uh, calls this group or call this group the Night Guardians or the Night Watch um, because they're basically um, engaged with the mysteries of the night, the mysteries of 
um, the womb, the mysteries of earth, the catonic mysteries, um, everything that the word night or black or so basically evokes. Um, and uh, the black man of the Sabbath, basically um, Master Leonard, um, which I guess we can use alternate, alternately, um, is one of its central um, reference, reference points, symbols, uh, spiritual guardians of that um, of that group, um, and um, yeah, I mean, I could I could talk about how how this how this uh, how this spirit actually um, is engaged, um, depending on yeah. where you wanna where you yeah. wanna take this. Um, hey, let's let's go down the go down that road, yeah. All right, we can go down that road. Um, well, basically. Um, if you really want to center and focus um, on the black man of the Sabbath as, you know, that, that central topic of this conversation, um, I guess we have to understand that spirit in that context as um, a spirit that is more close to, like, let's say, a voodoo spirit, if people know how those spirits manifest, rather than, let's say, a grimoire spirit or a Western kind of uh, demonic spirit you could encounter um you know uh, in, in in operations of western magic so um the way the black man of this uh, the black man was engaged or 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 basically come across by this group was um by certain magical workings um like uh, more or less 100 years ago um it's not a very ancient group or anything is it is a group that uh, basically was born out of i would say um the remnants of the german romantic tradition um and uh, certain people had a, a magical interest in you know returning to nature returning to engaging with um you know the natural world as a world of demonic appearances of images that you could encounter um and uh, which were not uh, which couldn't be encountered by rationality and by, you know, those things which the uh, Western world was predominantly uh, occupied in those, um, you know, turn of the century um, kind of days. So anyways, uh, this, the magical workings that this group of, of, of initiates, you could call them maybe, um, performed, drew a kind of spirit to them, which... Uh, for lack of another word, in a Western context, could be maybe considered to be an egregore, um, but not an egregore that is basically created by a thought form, like or is not a thought form created by collective, um, you know, fusion of vision or will, um, but it is basically a spirit that seemed to have been drawn to that particular um, style of magical work that was performed in order to actually engage. Um, the landscape and uh, the environment um, as a demonic appearance that could uh, basically impart itself to you um, in a different way than uh, a rational observation or an aesthetic observation of a landscape or um, a natural phenomenon uh, could provide. So from those kinds of magical environments, um, an uh, encounter with um, Master Leonard was achieved. And once that connection was built or was achieved, uh, maybe it was a kind of genius Loki at first. Um, once that was achieved, um, a society was basically formed around that um, entity and the pact which was created with that entity um, to uh, basically become a type of um, guide um, to lead initiates into um, a state of consciousness which we call night consciousness, a type of um, world experience um, that allows the individual to reconnect to the cosmos in a very different way than it is possible for the average Westerner um, or anyone basically touched by Western civilization, which basically is nearly everyone in the entire world. So when I, when I, when I, for example, say the Westernized man or the modern man, I don't only mean, of course, you know, 
um, the West as we define the West today, Europe, America, and and and, and other bits and pieces. But um, I mean, basically, um, everyone touched by Western civilization. So. Um, to give a bit of a broader perspective here, um, it's 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 my personal and many other people's uh, conviction that, of course, the the modern the modern individual engages the world is, uh, predominantly through a very rational, um, deconstructing, um, mechanistic um, mindset. The rational mind dictates the way we engage the world. Everything that's other, everything that's outside of us is immediately analyzed and deconstructed as soon as our gaze basically falls upon it. And this is not um, only in business, but this is, of course, uh, even when we go outside, you know, we see, I don't know, a tree, we see a lake. Um, I have a beautiful lake right here and the mountains uh, in the background. Um, you know, we immediately, of course, have this um, rational, dualistic way of approaching what we encounter. Um, and our rational faculties immediately compare, analyze, um, deconstruct, and uh, in this way basically give sense to the world we encounter. Um, that in the long run, of course, leads also to objectification and um, at best maybe to a very, um, you know, and maybe a sensual aesthetic appreciation, but it no longer leads to a type of um, we could even call it erotic encounter with what we basically um, meet outside of us. And when I mean erotic, I don't mean sexual per se, but something that um, is in some way also is ecstatic, something that is affecting. Um, so that kind of link uh, has been lost basically to modern man. Um, and very, very uh, rarely we break through this type of insulation that this atomized individual that we have become um, basically keeps us uh, or, or you know that, that atomized individual which we have um, imprisoned in that insulation very rarely uh, this insulation breaks open um, and when it does it's usually then considered um, to be a nightmarish experience you know uh, when you go into the interpretation of Lovecraft, the way Thomas Vincente does, maybe there you have like a, you know, an engagement there, you know, Lovecraft probably suffered from that kind of um, intrusion, which he considers to be probably an infestation of nightmarish experiences, because the insulation that a person, especially like Lovecraft, um, who was so kind of uptight and tense in many different ways, um, carried within him, and once that breaks open, it just, you know, becomes a terrifying experience. Um, because we are just used to that um, solid uh, uh, individuation, uh, which we also are being taught from our earliest childhood, you know. So um, I believe there is another way of relating to the world, a way um, that is not predominantly organized by the rational mind, the logos, you know, in a, in a more theological sense. Um, it is not a structure ordered from above that um, rationalizes the world and uh, 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 basically disenchants it uh, uh, in that sense. Um, and also then alienates us as individuals from the cosmos because we stand outside of its, um, you know, moving splendor of its um, dynamics, of its uh, 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 non-static ongoings, um, because of course we, we, we as individuals um, have a firm sense of being, a firm sense of self, which never really changes from when we are little kids to when we are adults and uh, old people, the sense of I always remains untouched by the flow of time, while everything else outside of us is, um, you know, of course, uh, 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 um, uh, privy uh, to the changes of time um, and is uh, affected by the changes of time. And so we as individuals struggle constantly against the tide of time um, and of change and maintaining our individual integrity, um, which is um, one of the, the major, I guess, um, uh, you know, uh, major typical um, ways of the individual of the West and in, in the way in which he engages its world. Um, I, I believe there are other ways 
um, in which we can engage the world. I believe that there is a um, a more holistic relationship that we can build with our environment. Um, we don't only see this still happening in, uh, let's say, natural societies as far as they still exist. We see it uh, sometimes in very sensitive artists and uh, creative people. Um, we uh, have rare individuals who, um, you know, by their own account, basically have these encounters with the world that are, you know, oftentimes, however, for such people overwhelming, and then we consider them lazy or we consider them, uh, you know, dreamy and so forth and so forth. So even those people um, do not even understand really what is happening to them. But when we engage, uh, when, or when we meet people from natural societies or people who sometimes are even um, engaging in plant spirits like ayahuasca, um, even the Westerners sometimes kind of fragmented experiences of a different type of relationship to the world. So I believe that once your rational faculty has been diminished or reduced or um, in some way weakened, um, another kind of self comes to the surface and breaks through and relates to what is encountered outside of you in a very, very different way. It's very hard to explain this kind of relationship um, to someone who has never experienced it, but you can see it, for example, in, 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 in voodoo possessions, for example, um, when the rational mind of the uh, voodoo initiate uh, collapses and the loa basically um, uh, arises in his head and takes control of uh, the person is basically an engagement with the world um, and with that particular aspect of the world which that lower represents. Um, and then uh, you can see, however, um, what I would then call a Dionysian ecstasy in the sense as that the person who is undergoing this ecstatic rapport, this ecstatic um, engagement with the world in a way that he is completely submerged, his um, spiritual identity or the identity of the rational self is completely vanished, but the person obviously is still there, right? I mean, you can still see him around, um, uh, but he is basically so possessed by the world in the in the aspect of a lower um, that he is no longer there. Um, and that to me is probably what would be experienced by a Maynard or a Dionysian ecstatic in the uh, ancient Greek period. Um, however, there are different forms of that kind of aesthetic relationship to the world. There is also um, that Ludwig Klages, the philosopher, called it the um, uh, the erotic, the, the erotic cosmogonic um, engagement with the world, where the one pole, the world, doesn't obliterate um, the pole of the um, ecstatic who engages the world, but both poles kind of connect without um, submerging the other. And then it's basically a dance, a dynamic dance, um, where you basically uh, 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 you basically are visioning um, the world in its um, unveiled kind of um, state. It is basically, you know, when you are um, engaging a landscape or when you're like looking at a forest. So uh, it's that moment where the forest as an aesthetic image that you just observe and maybe find pleasing or that you can, you know, dissect um, suddenly overwhelms you in a sense where um, you are still somehow there, but that what you, what you are envisioning or that what you are encountering is so powerfully impacting on you that you're literally sucked out of your rational personality and um, have, a, have, a, have a vision of what you are seeing, let's say a forest or a landscape, um, which no longer uh, resembles that kind of object which was there before. But it's that, you know, basically um, it's the soul of what you are um, usually only encountering as an object. You break through the surface of the body of what you're encountering and the, through the, however, aesthetics of that body that you're seeing, you're breaking through to that inner um, self of that encounter. And um, that then 
you know, creates a report with your own soul. Um, that kind of, that's that sounds maybe very complex, um, uh, but it's it's truly not if you really think about it. Um, and um, we all have experienced this when you know we 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 sit on a cliff. I don't know in the, in our holidays, and we um, you know are spellbound by a beautiful sunset, and that sunset literally sucks us out of our daily rational mind, and we only come back uh, to us basically. And even the way we say it, like, oh, you know, I was out of myself. Oh, you know, I just came back to myself. When somebody kind of like I don't know taps our shoulders and you know says, hey, David, you know, let's let's go have a drink or something, and then you know you just snap back. But in that moment before, you were still there. You were still David. But a David that was completely absorbed by the image, um, by that living image that I had been um, in erotic conversation with, in a sense, um, you know, in, a, in, in erotic uh, communion with. Um, and this kind of encounter, I think, you know, leads to tribal people considering plants to be spirits because they have a way to engage a plant and they don't just call it a spirit because they're ignorant, but you know, they see more than the botanist would see. They see more than the biologist would see. You know, they can encounter um, a phenomenal appearance. And like Heidegger would say, allow it to be itself. And by not exercising that appropriation by will, by immediately um, you know, deconstructing what we are encountering, but by basically forcing ourselves to stay back and to allow what we encounter to unveil itself, which is, you know, basically um, uh, thwarting our will to power. When we do this, something unveils itself to us or has the opportunity or the chance to unveil itself to us. And that is not a very simple thing. And it's not something that anyone can do, I believe. But this is then what happens. And when people are able to do this, um, a different kind of understanding arises, um, what your place is in the world, how you can connect to the world, um, and other laws arise from that kind of encounter. And natural societies, in my opinion, are all based and um, their entire judicial system, social system, everything is um, entirely based on um, that ecstatic encounter with the world um, and the center um, and all of that encounter that gives meaning to who they are and um, it, 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 it basically produces um, the society um, which uh, they keep sacred. While in our society it's completely different, of course, you know, um, our society is based on completely different laws. So with that ex excurse, and I think maybe we would touch upon different different aspects of this, Master Leonard or the black man is someone um, is a is a basically is a, is an emissary uh, like uh, Thomas Vincenta would call it of that kind of ecstatic world um, vitality, um, which basically creates the uh, possibility for that encounter, the vitality of the world that we have the possibility to reconnect to, however, which is outside of us if we remain in that rationalistic. Um, monadic, um, you know, individuated personality, which then remains outside of us, um, is the world that we can reconnect to. And once we do this, our experience of the world and the uh, uh, um, and the basically the uh, uh, so not only the experience of the world we have, but also that what then gives meaning to our lives becomes a totally different thing. Also, the way we view death, which maybe is another topic we, we can talk about, the, the way we view death and what role death plays in that kind of um, uh, worldview is different to the way death is, uh, is obsessing us in our world now, um, which is a taboo at one point and at some in another way, it's an obsessive um, topic as well. Um, all of this becomes completely different and the black man is basically a kind of uh, maybe it's a cycle pump in that sense um, that 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 allows or helps our souls to reconnect to that ensouled phenomenal world um, that is the cosmos. It helps us to basically um, disconnect from that uh, obsessive, transcendental, mm -hmm. um, 
orientation that not only, of course, most spiritual systems have taken, um, but also that uh, is the integral setup of our personality yeah. and of our selfhood. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah tru truly interesting stuff, you know, and a, a really, um, it, it really makes me think about like some of the folklore in, in Ireland or in the Dark Man, because the encounters that happen um, that are detailed in the folklore are ones that shock people out of their kind of you know that their 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 rationality like that those encounters that happen like at night are these massively disrupting encounters um where the individual who has that experience in some way can't go back to their normal life you know like that you know, i think it's 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 allegorical to 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 what you're saying sorry i interrupted you well, well no no i mean it's, it's important because the point you're making is very important because however back in the days in irish folklore in german folklore um <clears throat> you know european folk in in any i think folklore that you can find let's say in pre-christian times or even in christian times we always hear the stories about um sensitive people um encountering um the demonic world and when i say demonic i mean not that in the cliche sense of a negative demon but um the affecting world um in figures like odin the shape-shifting god of the germans and the scandinavians you know wotan who you know um comes as the wanderer uh, or you know encounters people on the path you know as an old man um you have it in these uh, tales where people are being sucked into a mountain and uh you know encountering the king in the mountain or the hero in the mountain um or um suddenly people are being brought into the venus mountain before you know venus or or another goddess um so back in the days um i believe those tales were familiar to people because it happened all the time you know that um there was a fluidity between um, the world and oftentimes then that world impacted on people in certain shapes and forms, let's say the black man, let's say in other forms, um, animals or, or you know, uh, tree, la landscapes, you know, um, people were transformed, people could engage the world, the outside, the other, um, in a natural way uh, that wasn't unfamiliar even to the people who hadn't had that experience. But by this experience being integral to society, everyone had a part in it. And that's the important thing. It's also the important thing in initiation in, let's, for lack of a better word, a shamanic or shamanistic societies. Not everyone is a shaman there. However, um, the experience of the shaman um, is shared uh, with everyone in that tribal group in that society in such an intimate way that it's there is no need for everyone to undergo this um, because uh, uh, um, the structure of the society allows everyone to participate in that otherworldly encounter. And this is also the sense of uh, initiation, whether it's voodoo or whether it's Af other African traditions that I know of, because I lived, I was born in Africa and I lived in Africa for a long time. Um, so these initiations too are designed to put the individual in touch with the cosmos and certain aspects of the cosmos which are the most profound or the most important to certain aspects of life um, and it is also uh, designed to basically show that the individual is as fluid as the um, demonic world that one encounters so even great gods like Odin or great spirits in Afrocentric religions oftentimes um, are dying or are um, being slaughtered in the rituals. However, just to arise again in different form. So you, it dies in one form, it arises in another. That just shows the initiate that basically um, uh, 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 nothing dies everything is constantly transforming, everything is in flux. Um, uh, and so is the individual. The individual is not a finite monad, 
But in those systems, and that to me is essential, while we have that monadic individuation um, obsession, the self as an integral holistic uh, unit, in those societies, the selfhood is uh, 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 um, a kind of fluid conglomerate of very many different bits and pieces, ancestral souls, spirits, um, all kinds of different, even stars, all kinds of things. Nobody would assume um, the person is one thing that can be kept insulated and basically shielded from the outside world. On the contrary, um, there is, and I used to call it in my in my teachings, um, I used to call it, there is a type of black hole inside of the individual that is in constant communion, communion and conversation with the other, with the outside, with the cosmos. And not only, of course, unconsciously, like in the way we know that, you know, like magnetic magnet, magnetism and and radioactivity constantly impacts on us and 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 has a reaction in our body. Our organs um, are basically, of course, reacting to certain impulses from outside that we cannot control. We're we're constantly being pulsed through by things from outside. You know, even food goes in and goes out. Um, so we're in constant communion with the cosmos in one way or another. So, however, also metaphysically. Um, these things are acknowledged um, that and 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 the composition of the self from all those different things which are also constantly in flux um, allows a, allows a, a better relationship with the world that is always becoming nothing in the world except the mind of the human identity is fixed nothing if we can know this scientifically and even the human being uh, in 10 years, not even one molecule of my body is probably the same as 10 years ago, because obviously it's constantly changing. Um, the only thing that never really changes or appears not to change is my sense of identity. Um, so that is the only thing in the entire cosmos, which apparently is static. Um, and so are the gods that we have projected outside of us into transcendence to give meaning to that source or whatever you know is uniform in each and every uh, human individual that has a sense of i um and uh, my fascination lays with that definition of selfhood as a constantly changing metamorphosing conglomerate of different bits and pieces which can put into relationship with the cosmos in africa there are many different ways there's there is um, of course Divination, you know, like Ifa. Um, in Voodoo, there are, def there are many different techniques, also divination, and you can see what is the problem. Is it the ancestor? Is it this? Is it that that is impacting on us? And, and so, you know, one can negotiate one's position and one can change things. Um, and <clears throat> this kind of idea of that fluid selfhood, of course, arises from uh, a very, very profound and deep experience of the self as being related to the demonic appearances and the changes um, and the cyclical changes that the cosmos has as its natural state. Otherwise, such an such a such a definition such a definition of selfhood could never really appear. Just as the definition of the selfhood as an insulated monad um, comes from that over time always you know, stronger um, sensation of uh, the rational identity that then smart people like Bataille and Klages and the late Heidegger um, identified as a, a huge problem. The, uh, you know, that, sol that, that, that solid eye, which basically, um, uh, 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 you know, dried up the fluidity of life. Um, it dried up the human ability to basically um, in integrate itself in the rhythms of the cosmos and into like the pulse of uh, the vitality of life. Um, and Klages then had that interesting opposition of the logos, which is the um, ruling and organizing principle of the spirit or the rational mind and you know the, the, the modern mind. 
and the and eros, you know, that web of um power which establishes um uh which establishes uh, 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 a mating of or establishes an ecstatic encounter between um affecting and affected um souls. Um I, I find that a very fascinating uh view um on on the way we can relate uh in the world. Okay. Uh and I, I love that. I, and, and the the more I kind of I'm digesting what you're saying, I, I'm kind of rerunning my own kind of um, brush up against this, you know, uh, and kind of what it did to me and, and how it changed my view on things, what it exposed me to, like, like you said, like, like uh, the, the mm. how your ancestors are actually, you know, active participants in your own life now you know that their influence comes down through uh through time through 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 the decades through the centuries um it, it's an extraordinary thing you know and, and and but it really brings me back to that kind of reflection and that we get in the folklore it's a shattering you know it like it, it when we get broken out of that kind of like Descartesian Cartesian worldview you know like it, right. it's it can be quite damaging, you know, and and uh, and something that people have to overcome and get, get through, you know. Um, I mean, I I believe it's quite damaging for sure. I mean, there are people who end up in an asylum basically yeah. once that happens, right? Yeah. Um, because we have no references for this, exactly. right? This is the problem. Like either you're mad, yeah. um, or you know, uh, 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 or it oftentimes doesn't happen. I think also like we also have to be very careful because there's a trend now. There's a trend now for people to kind of reject transcendentalism or neoplatonism. It's kind of boring. Eh? You know, we don't want to like, I don't, or we don't want to subjugate spirits into a triangle because they are lesser beings or they are like, um, you know, n less pure. So now we want to be their friends. And you know what, you know, what happens is um, a, a sentimental and nearly infantile shift of, um, a shift of approach and shift of um, sentimentalities of what we would like to have. And what people don't realize, um, what is not happening is basically a shift from a logocentric, rationalistic um, uh, world experience to a more, let's call it, catonic or more holistic world experience. But what happens is you exchange one rational model for another that pleases you more. It's one you know, um, it's one choice that you make because you find it more reasonable, more, more pleasurable, more interesting, and maybe even more intellectually pleasing at this point. Um, but what it doesn't really do is provide you with um, a truly, let's call it even pagan um, world experience to adopt a pagan paradigm rationally and because you find it for whatever reason more interesting more pleasing more whatever is not the same as experiencing it and that's uh, and that's uh, something i've lectured on uh, as well because it's a fundamental issue in uh in the modern world and uh, heidegger and other people um have dismissed all types of lebensreform or any kind of spiritual attempt to um turn around to a more holistic way of life um, for those particular reasons. And not only uh, Heidegger, but Clarks as well. They said, like, these people who play at, like, um, you know, pick and choose what is more pleasing um, are staying within a rationalist paradigm, you know? Now they've exchanged Jesus and 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 uh, Yahweh or um, you know Buddha or 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 Allah for um Hecate, Dionysus, and um, whatever other, you know, spirits they may encounter, or or, or Genius Loki. But the the funny thing is, they do not really encounter these spirits on the level of ecstasy and soul. But they kind of like project again their own idealisms, um, their own expectations, um, and their own rationalist mind onto that spiritual arena they find more pleasing. And then you see all these, um, you know, pagan um, uh, 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 systems which are as rationalistic uh, and as, um, well, 
they are no really no different from any monotheistic environment. Um, they just exchange certain sensitivities and certain, you know, uh, uh, um, paradigms um, one yeah. for the other. Yeah. And 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 uh, this is why, for example, even in even in truly, uh, you know, more naturalistic systems like voodoo, for example, um, it's not easy. I mean, there are people who naturally inherit, let's say, spirits, or people, of course, who are more still encounter with that kind of, let's call it, biocentric way of relating to the world. But in 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 most, in all, I would say even, uh, traditional spiritual systems, there has to be initiation. And the initiation opens your head. It provides you a space um, which then is related to that kind of um, encounter with spirits. Um, mm. You have to be prepared. Otherwise, even in those worlds, you may be shattered by it. Yeah. You know, if you're not prepared, um, nothing good will come of it. Um, and you do not know how to handle that kind of in that kind of encounter. It's yeah. not a negative encounter. Um, it's not an infestation, it's not a problem, but it's so powerful that if you do not know what to do, um, you will have a problem. Uh, so basically, um, in our in our world today, um, I believe many people have deep experiences, have um, experiences of even a certain initiatic quality, yeah. but because we do not live in a society that basically mirrors back such experiences to us in a meaningful way, like traditional societies where the initiates, when they come out of the initiation rituals, are immediately encountering the, their tribal you know, uh, peers, and they immediately mirror back certain things. So the initiation deepens um, by the encounter with the people who are part of that cos cosmogram, basically. Mm. We don't have this. So even initiatic experiences are only private and individual, fragmented. Um, nobody there to kind of like put it in in perspective. Yeah. And um, so what it mostly does is either confuses people, gives them some weird ego trip, or derails them, mm -hmm. um, or it or it just becomes some kind of like I don't know individual you know, uh, uh, individual point of view type of spirituality. Um, and it fails to deepen. And this is uh, something that I um, find very problematic uh, in the West. And this is why I, for example, um, had looked for uh, initiation in voodoo, for example, and in other uh, more traditional systems, which link and relate me to what I consider the biocentric cosmos. Right. Um, because I think we alone, no matter how deep, the experiences we have. And I know this is a very unpopular opinion, probably. Um, but I say it anyways, because I believe it's important, you know, um, that one says the things um, that the integrity um, demands from one. So uh, uh, I believe the people who have those encounters by themselves, like you said, even today, this is possible, right? Like we we, we said before we, we recorded it, you had uh, very profound encounters in, in India and, and other places. Um, and when they hit so deep, it's, I believe, very important to look for a way in which to put such perspective, such experiences in a in a context and not in a context of our own doing, because what we will do as as rational egos, we will put them into a pleasing context. We will we will create our own worldview where those encounters um, uh, 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 are suddenly to be made sense or to be made sensible. So the encounter in itself doesn't stand and provide basically the worldview which then unfolds because we lack all the references that could do so, or could help us do so. So we use all the rationalistic transcendental world that we know and start to build, you know, a kind of marketplace of religion type of religion, mm -hmm. you know, that may have as its starting point a genuine biocentric encounter, but then gets deconstructed um, and taken out of its vital context. And that is the greatest danger, um, which I think most people won't care about because um, everyone just cares about like um, 
easy to do things. And uh, when I see uh, basically everybody, no, everybody lives their uh, spirituality on Instagram, making photos of all their altars and all their little rituals and saying how profound this encounter was and that encounter was, you know, to me, you know, this is basically um, a further path into um, desacralizing uh, mm -hmm. your spiritual life. And of course, of um, taking it more and more into a virtual realm, uh, away from the blood and guts um, of the actual work itself. And the blood and guts are good if they're good for Instagram, you know, um, but they're not good because, you know, they are there for the, for itself. And yeah. uh, unless it's, and, unless it's not photographed or unless it's not reported to the bigger outside world, it doesn't, it didn't happen. Right. Yeah. yeah. Because that's our audience. That's the people who reflect back no longer traditional initiates who then mirror back our initiation because we have a biocentric society that helps us do this. Now, we even if we have a, a the claim to catonic or biocentric work, who mirrors this back to us? Our Instagram community, our Facebook community that we actually cater to. Because yeah. what, what, what do we want? A legacy, you know, influence, all the things that would be meaningless if you have a truly shocking, mind-blowing literally mind-blowing where yes. your mind your rational mind blows <laughs> apart when you have that nothing else becomes important anymore no show off no nothing mm -hmm. and yeah that's yeah. that's really powerful um and and one of the things that, that i'm really kind of going over uh, in in my experience um from which aligns in what you're saying is i like i had a direct communication um uh which said um don't engage with the digital world like it, it literally came with me said it's, it's it's not for you you know um which is you know the opposite of what i should be doing when i'm you know about but, but a, a a a podcast to to to, to get out I there i think it's but, not the same it was, i it was mean so interesting. i I think I think you know you are one of those very good examples of someone who has done tremendous work. Uh, I, I encountered your work um, years ago with the Agori stuff, and uh, before even you know before I put together like when 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 Peter uh, put us in touch, um, I wasn't even aware that you were the guy who actually did that Agori stuff, which I loved uh, uh, years ago, in which I was yeah. like, wow, you know, I wish I could talk to that guy. <laughs> um, and you know, you you have a very very deep degree of integrity because of course you could have you know i don't know you know shown off uh probably you have like a, a hundred thousand more photos you know stored uh, away yeah. and you could like i don't know post a photo every week and say like you know uh, and, and kind of pretend how deep you were friends with all the agoris and you know how you were kind of an agori yourself but you never did that i think you have a very very strong integrity and um running a podcast you know to basically bring different perspectives um, to a, a wider audience, I think is a very, very beautiful service okay. um, to the uh, esoteric community because uh, unfortunately and fortunately, um, the younger people today, we are still young too, but there are people a little <laughs> bit younger than us um, who have not like us probably um, lived in a, a spiritual life in a world before the internet, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so uh, nowadays, you know, uh, uh, information is so easily available um, but also there's an overdose and there are a lot of pretenders, posers, wrong avenues, problematic paths. Mm -hmm. So I think with all of that out there, you know, I think um, there needs to be some in, uh, people with a certain type of integrity um, who provide something not to convert, not to convince that I don't I don't believe in that at all. Um, but I believe in keeping a certain type of in integer environment alive. Mm -hmm for a more pa pathic, pathetic way of saying it, you know, to keeping the flame, you know, alive in dark times. Yeah. Um, and, and I think if people do that within an initiatic environment or um, with the work they do for the spiritual community, there will always be those few individuals who link up with that and who will then provide the initiatic chain, you know, in those times where basically, uh, uh, um, there is a very superficial marketplace of religion at work that caters to that very shallow consumer oriented individual. And it doesn't matter if that individual calls itself neoplatonist 
monotheist, um, a ketonic or a biocentric uh, a magician or a uh, pagan, doesn't matter. 99% of those people remain in, that in, in the same rationalist, mechanistic, logocentric structure. Mm -hmm. And to break this down, even in voodoo, if you have dreams, if you have pro profound encounters, you would immediately go to a voodoo priest or a voodoo priestess and ask for reading. Mm -hmm. And then this person would discuss and, and, and help you figure out what is going on. Is that a call from the spirits for you to initiate? Because sometimes the spirits want you to initiate because then they can um, relate to you in a more profound way. They can encounter you in a more um, uh, powerful way, which then, however, also puts obligation upon you to engage with the people who are also part of that kind of society or, tra or tradition. Um, or it says, it maybe obliges you to different things. Like you say, maybe maybe the dead have impacted on you in, in a certain way. Um, and that may be the first step for you, uh, and not for you, I say for yeah. one, you know, um, uh, uh, to basically maybe enter a different kind of world experience where the dead no longer are, and this is a thing, if we as rational people from the West, doesn't matter if we are Catholic or, or Christian or not, we are grown up in a way where the dead do not exist. The dead are the dead are fantasy or they reside in a transcendental place that has no relationship with the uh, world of the living because that's, of course, you know, Christian doctrine. You know, the dead are literally in a transcendence with God or, or in hell. Um, and you cannot actually encounter the dead because they're not where you are, right? So... Um, so also when you have, and, and of course, I've been around the block many times. So of course, if you have ancestral worship in the in the usual pagan community here in the West, you know, um, you don't they don't understand why they do this. It's kind of like, yeah, I guess, you know, the dead uh, are around and then they kind of adopt some kind of ideas, you know, which they have read in some books. Um, but that erotic, deep, tangible encounter with the dead is not is not is not um, established because what is missing is the breaking down of the rational mind which insulates you from these experiences what you do have is either a certain type of um you know self hypnosis where you where you where you want to believe in what you are doing and then you feel something um or you have some kind of uh, uh you know aesthetic reaction or you know um, we all have deeper states of reacting to things, you know, uh, if we especially make it very spooky or we make it very sacred, um, what, you know, tickles the senses. Um, but it usually doesn't go further um, than that um, outer level that we as individuals also allow to happen because this is the way we are raised and we cannot escape this. See, this is the point. And it's so hard to break this. So I do not judge anyone who lives uh, a pagan spirituality or any other spirituality that's based on those models because most people have no time and not, not the determination. They are not made for this radical move um, into the territory uh, that the black man in its most let's say, um, powerful dimension presides over, um, you know, going as far as Bataille, who thought, you know, maybe only a human sacrifice could provide that breakdown of um, the rational mind in order for us to extend into the cosmos. And that exactly is also what Klage said. Also, he didn't believe in human sacrifice in, in that sense, but he believed only very, very strong methods could even provide even an inkling of what that could mean. Um, and Heidegger had, had, had a whole late philosophy. His whole late philosophy is basically uh, 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 focused on what I would call thinking from the abyss, you know, basically um, trying to establish, you know, a, a, a space in which um, that homelessness we feel as isolated, insulated individuals will end and we can return, you know, to, to that kind of demonic. Um, experience of the world as that's what we are actually part of. We are also a demonic appearance. You know, Ludwig Klage says, uh, the body is the manifestation of the soul and the soul is the meaning of the living body. So time and space. So time would be the, the soul of space and space would be the body of time. 
um, a word would be the body of the meaning of that word, you know? And a word is an ecstatic uttering um, in the primordial way, was a word was an, a primordial um, uh, uh, ecstatic uttering that is um, that came out of an experience, out of a demonic encounter, out of something that shook you so deep that it forced a birth. So I believe we can, when we encounter the world in that primordial way, what happens is we become pregnant by the world. The world inseminates us. So we undergo a state of insemination, pregnancy, and birth. And the birth could be a word. It could be a movement. It could be a gesture, um, or you know, it could be a sculpture we 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 sculpt. It could be, however, it must, however, be something that we are prompted to do, um, and that we don't do because we rationally decided now we're going to do a sculpture of Hermes. You know, it's that sculpture we have to put, we have to do. Is that book you had to write, because you know the black man um, placed it so deeply before you that you can't refuse, right? And then that triggers um, a reaction. Uh, so these kinds of encounters no longer are um, truly available to us. <clears throat> or if they are, they are fragmented, very rare, and we can't put them in perspective. Um, and I think the, the Black man is one of those powerful icons, um, uh, powerful symbols, or powerful, but as a symbol, also a demonic pathway, a, pa a pathway that can affect us if the symbol is presented in a, in a proper way, um, that this could be a tangible, uh, it's a tangible pathway into that night consciousness, which then basically revolutionizes our entire way of experiencing the world and everything that's associated um, to it, humanism, materiality, um the way we the way we see death the way we see um the world itself everything changes completely from the fundamentals from the foundations um and i believe to do this by yourself is nearly impossible because the rational mind the i the ego is so strong and so deceiving that um you alone, you will never be able without someone who mirrors things back to you to break this down. And I believe this is where all those traditional um, uh, uh, spiritualities are correct. I mean, they, they break this down often uh, in order for you to elevate even further um, into a transcendental space, even further away from, you know, the darkness uh, of the body. Um, so I believe that, um, however, the understanding that something needs to be broken down in order for it to change and that we can't do it on our own because the deceptive traps that the I, the ego, the transcendental ego or whatever is, uh, is, is the logos is so strong that it will never allow us to escape that kind of, um, you know, prison that we then tell ourselves we've already escaped, you know? Yeah, yeah. that makes an awful lot of sense. David, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation. I, I really enjoyed it, and I've, I've taken an awful lot from it. And I know I'm going to continue to take a lot from it as, as when I listen back through it. Um, if people want to follow you or, or um, learn more about your work, where's the best place for them to do so? Well, um, I didn't I didn't mention this, I guess, in the in the introduction. Um, uh, I'm also the owner of Theon Publishing with my um, friend Jessica. Uh, so usually we will publish things there that are um, important uh, to our current, not of course all our books, because mm -hmm. we, we we care for a broader uh, perspective. That's that's something that is important as well. Um, but um, yeah, Thomas Vincente's work is published by us and other people's work, and of course. Um, I guess if one uh, Googles cosmic gnosis and my name, um, things will come up yeah. um, and there will be some um, new new adventures, which I will share with uh, the public yeah. um, in the near future um, that I think could be interesting to a broader, broader, uh, broader community, um, at least, you know, um, to engage with some of those ideas a little bit more intimately. Well, so I'd love to have you back on whenever 
the time is right we want to yeah, talk yeah absolutely a absolutely i loved it and i hope it wasn't too abstract in some ways but you know i didn't want to repeat all the mm. things that you have discussed with thomas vincente mm. thomas vincente on all those you know um uh, bits and pieces of, of of religion and mythology is of course much more depth than i am uh he's a you know uh he's a, a very 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 uh great adept uh, on those levels um, but I hope that our angle provided um, another perspective, which then yeah, hopefully so. also deepens, you know, um, uh, those conversations you had on the black man um, with other people. So um, I hope that was fruitful for uh, your audience. Well, thank you. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you, David. Uh, fascinating conversation, really fascinating conversation and a, and, a, and a superb addition to the, the Dark Man conversations that we've had on this show to date. Um, there's some really important reflections uh, to be taken from, from this show. Um, it, it really presents an entirely different way of seeing the world. And I hope you got a lot from it. I certainly did. Um, do check the show notes for further information and further reading. Um, right, I'm Darren Mason. You've been listening to The Spirit Box. Take care and talk soon.